makes a lot of sense in this case because he had such a bad first game that he, he, you know he wants to extend the games, practice uh, playing some consistent chess, which is what he's known for. He he really doesn't. That first game was a bit uncharacteristic. That was a real blowout, and I think that mainly happens when Wesley plays Magnus. Right. And so I think it's going to be a confidence builder to see himself up upon, to see himself in end games where he's playing a, a two result uh, a game where he can win or draw. I think that that's going to build some confidence, and I think that's pretty big for Wesley. When he's playing a guy like Magnus, who he has, uh, you know, he's never beaten in, in, in some formats and just has has a negative score against. Right. Well, playing fast here to start this next game, we see Wesley with five minutes and six seconds, everybody. Uh, more time than, than he started with. But and, and so as a match goes on, you think that that's part of, partly why you might play on games like that. Just the fact that you psychologically get used to looking at a board where you have an advantage against Magnus Carlsen, right? The world champion. And that's something Wesley's going to need uh, in, in his favor as, as, the, as the gloves come off here today. Oh, for sure. It would have been useful for me. I, I stopped getting good positions at a certain point. And Magnus, he really starts finding his rhythm. And so you got to try to stop him there, tire him out, get those good, you know, good end games. Uh, I agree with the choice. I understand why he's doing it. All right. Well, um, now we have this knight on e5 and uh, a, probably a, a little bit of an edge for white here. This is sort of a typical kind of uh, whatever this was, a uh, a Larson Larson knight of three b three. We saw Hikaru Nakamura use this opening a lot against Fabiano Caruana in their match. Um, is there something to this opening here that it maybe maybe just a kind of comfortable blitz opening where the plans are easy for White to coordinate the knights, the moves are able. You know, you're developing very fast. Is is that is that one of the reasons you see this opening in blitz so often? Yes, easy to make moves, easy to pre move. Um, and it doesn't matter too much uh, what your opponent does. So you really can uh, come up with a pretty quick start. Uh, one thing I'll say is uh, it's also just a, a fun opening for black as well. Okay. Like these hanging pawn positions, you can play like a bit aggressively. Uh, and it's a lot harder for white to maybe find the precise positional moves that often, uh, you know, stifle uh, these openings. So I think, um, uh, I think it's good for both sides. Uh, Magnus is going to have to play dynamic to justify. Uh, I mean, he's, he's expanded a bit. Those pawns are also targets. Um, so it's sort of, we'll see who imposes their will here. But uh, it has talk, some benefit. Talk about this move f6, right? A little bit, I mean, so it obviously has the clear intention of removing the knight from such a strong square, but also a move that could eventually have some Ooh. some backfire capabilities Ooh. with the light square. What, what's going on here? Oh, yeah, it was just after he, he took first. Uh, he wanted to uh, create that uh, isolated pawn. Uh, but yeah, Wesley had this c6 in between move that Magnus may have missed. Yeah, not not entirely sh sure. But uh, what I see now is just uh, White should be positionally better. And what the, I mean, the trade of the, the D, White's D pawn for Black C pawn is a big, big, big plus for White because yeah. now White can uh, isolate this D5 pawn. Highlighting that line with c6, showing everybody what Wesley calculated that he would have his choice of winning the a6 or the e4 knight with Queen takes d5, and so. That's a very good point, Eric. So now with that transition that maybe Magnus missed when he played f6, we have this position on the board where black is clearly the one positionally worse with the d5 pawn being isolated. Yeah. No, he's lost uh, a lot of the dynamic uh, poss possibility like in the structure. Um, black, okay. black, black's only good piece here. I mean, not I shouldn't say that, but the knight on e4, you know, yeah. you want to do something with that. You want to coordinate that. Um, but... The problem is Magnus is going to have to uh, sit and think pretty soon here uh, to figure out how he can avoid this momentum where black, uh, where white's just trying to trade everything off. But this and is a very nice idea here yes. by Magnus. He's actually forcing the trade on c5. Not very yeah. often is a knight involved in a fork, but here the knight is attacking. Well, Wesley's, Wesley's that's queen is just... Is just uh, oh, I yeah. Mean, I mean, what happened here? All of he's a losing, he's, yeah, he's losing some material here. I mean, queen a3 may work but it looks like a move you don't want to play you might, might get embarrassed on you know something like knight, <laughs> to, uh, knight to d3 everybody knight and... to d3 and then there's b4 and you're, you're holding on but you're not entirely sure so but here he's just down exchange and uh well lost although this allows knight takes e7 and oh bishop a3 there's queen e5 okay so bishop a3 queen e5 or or queen oh. e8 okay that also saves the exchange huh queen e5 but may have been better though no, but this goes into the end game with his protected pass pawn. The other line, yeah, queen e five might have might have been better. But this is also a really comfortable end game just because he's got that protected pass pawn. Right. I think I think the problem with rook b eight here is maybe rook d one is a little too quick. So I think white can win the b file uh, first. But yeah, Magnus, if you played queen e five, may have just been winning uh, on the spot. 
That's super interesting there. I mean, it felt like uh, F6 has played, and, and Wesley finds this nice little trick to create an isolated queen pawn, but then immediately <laughs> overplays his hand on the queen side, Eric, and gets his own queen trap. That's uh, that's That's got to be disappointing there. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think he was quite comfortable with his uh, position and, and just completely missed that idea. It, this game has, you know, we're seeing the players still uh, get into the, the rhythm. There's been a few in inaccuracies, but that's obviously going to happen. Um, well, Black we, here for his part. Yeah, he's maximizing the king. Uh, I'm not sure about a move like rook b7. Yeah, rook b7, I'm not sure how he's planning to deal with it. But his, his idea is he, he doesn't mind giving up pawns, Danny. He needs his rook on b2. Yeah. So he'd love for white to take on h7 and play rook b2 and use that active king, active c pawn, and rook to to uh, generate a lot of counterplay uh, uh, on, well, in white's uh, queen side. Yeah, showing that line for the fans there because I think it's an instructional moment to remind them that uh, active rooks three? are often worth a pawn in the end games, right? The Diveret the Diveretsky theory, you'd rather have the more active king and the more active rook than than a pawn and. Wesley knows that too, though, which is why he didn't just go take h7 and allow that rook b8 idea. And now now he mm -hmm. may be able to win the c-pawn with rook c7 check and take c4, even though that allows yeah. a move like rook e2. So sort of yeah. a, a lot to think about here, which is why Wesley's taking a moment. Yeah, rook end games. These are, these are very tough to evaluate. He can win the c-pawn. He allows rook e2. I don't think you want to allow rook e2. That's all. That's all. I think a draw, if he can get a draw, is, is, is good. 